Hey guys, it's Dr. Childs here and I just want to do a quick video um, to go over how to reduce TPO antibodies, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly go over um, kind of find five main steps that I use in patients that uh, come and see me with Hashimoto's and elevated TPO uh, antibodies. So number one um, is definitely going to be getting on the right type of diet for your body, okay? And so uh, I've done a, a pretty long extensive post in the past that goes over the five diets that show how they um, can affect antibody, affect antibody and autoimmune levels. Um, but in this one, I'm just going to go over kind of the top three here. So number one being the AIP diet or autoimmune paleo diet. Um, what I want to say about this one is it really isn't for everybody. It's a pretty restrictive diet and it can make um, following this diet over the long term pretty, pretty difficult for many patients. However, I do recommend it if you've tried some of the um, less restrictive diets and have failed those, uh, or if you have a history of multiple autoimmune diseases. Okay, so that's number one. Number two is the gluten-free, dairy-free, soy-free diet. So basically, I recommend everybody at minimum start here with this diet, okay? And the reason is uh, it's, it has pretty good success in lowering uh, autoimmunity and uh, antibody levels in patients. Um, it's relatively easy to follow, and it's something that you can stick with long term. Okay, so that's, that'd be number two. Number three would definitely be the uh, SIBO or the low FODMAPS diet. Okay, and so by SIBO, what I'm meaning here is small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. Um, and this is a condition that patients with um, hypothyroidism or Hashimoto's are extremely susceptible to developing, okay? So something about, something like 54% of hypothyroid patients actually have this condition. Um, and, and what happens if you have SIBO or um, um, basically yeast overgrowth, which they, they tend to go together, so um, I kind of lump them together here. But um, if you have these conditions, it's, it is an inflammatory condition. Uh, it will make your autoimmune disease worse. It will cause low-grade inflammation in the gut. It will decrease uh, T4 to T3 conversion. Just causes a lot of nasty things for hypothyroid patients. Definitely things that you don't want to have going on in your body. So there is a specific diet. Um, it's called the low FODMAP diet low FODMAPS diet. I'm not going to go over what that, that acronym um, actually means right now, but basically um, you're getting rid of some longer chain uh, carbohydrates that certain bacteria and uh, fungus feed off of. And so you're basically starving out the, the yeast and the bacteria by not giving them the substrate they use uh, to survive. Okay. So number one, get on the right type of diet for your body. Uh, number two, this is, this is another big one, but consider using androgens. And so by androgens, what I mean is using DHEA and or testosterone. So um, testosterone is pretty awesome um, if you have an autoimmune disease. And so and I, I, I want to use this example. So if you've ever been around uh, patients with Hashimoto's or patients with autoimmune diseases in general, you'll notice that almost all of them are women. Okay, And so men have a have a much less risk of developing autoimmune disease and part of that reason is felt to be due to testosterone okay and so um, if you start checking these patients with Hashimoto's or low TPO antibodies you start to see trends and one of the trends that I've seen is almost all these people have low free and total testosterone and low DHEA levels okay now yes some people have high testosterone levels when they fall into like the PCOS, PCOS spectrums with hypothyroidism but most people with Hashimoto's um, typically have low test free and total testosterone levels okay so what testosterone does is it boosts immune function and it helps your body educate educate between self uh, and foreign tissue it can also cause some extra weight loss increased libido has a bunch of great um, effects for for women especially those with um, Hashimoto's um, and elevated TPO antibodies okay so the way you're going to do that is you're going to test for the free internal testosterone and you can check for DHEA and GHEAS or sulfate in the serum and so what I like to do is at least find patients in the upper uh, one-third of the reference range or even higher if they're lower like in the lower one-third of the reference range I'll usually say hey you know you'll probably get a uh, you know a bunch of benefit if you consider using testosterone transdermally or DHEA transdermally um, especially if women come in and they say you know I have no sex drive I'll say, okay, then, and they have these, you know, these antibodies or they have Hashimoto's, that's the kind of patient that will do really, really well on androgens. I do recommend using just a uh, transdermal application for both DHEA and testosterone though, okay? So you will need prescriptions for both of those. Has to do with the conversion, which you can kind of see um, in this image here, uh, basically uh, how DHEA can go down the testosterone metabolism, okay? Uh, number three would be to consider using zinc or selenium, okay? Um, and both of these are, are very, um, great nutrients that are reducing inflammation and boosting immune function, okay? And so what I've done here is I've uh, included a, a study showing that zinc can act as an antioxidant and anti-inflammatory agent um, in humans. It, it's, it's a really um, great 
uh, nutrient for patients with high antibodies. So zinc, what it's going to be doing is it can boost your immune function, does the same thing um, um, as some of these other things do. They basically educate the, the body between foreign substance and um, self-tissue. Zinc specifically acts as an antioxidant and an anti-inflammatory agent. Also reduces oxidative stress. And a really great thing about it is it increases T4 to T3 conversion. Okay? Selenium, on the other hand, will can specifically help to lower TPO antibodies by itself and also boost T4 to T3 conversion. So that's another uh, huge benefit from zinc and selenium. Uh, in terms of dosing, you don't really want to take more than 50 to 60 milligrams of zinc per day. You don't really want to take more than 200 to 400 micrograms of selenium per day. Okay, and so what I will typically um, recommend is you, you look in the blood, you see where your level's at, and then you consider using supplementation at that point. However, I will say that many patients do need supraphysiologic doses of these nutrients. So regardless of what the lab shows, sometimes it's beneficial to take um, some of these beyond that, okay? Uh, the, let's see, what number am I? Number four here. So gut function. So I'm gonna come back to this whole SIBO and yeast thing that I mentioned previously. And here's the statistic that I, that I was talking about. 54% of hypothyroid patients have SIBO, and if you have SIBO, you usually have yeast with that. The symptoms that you might be looking for, if you're curious if you have it, would be things like gas and bloating postprandially or 30 to 60 minutes after a meal. These patients also have tons of constipation, chronic constipation. They may not go but once every you know, two, three, four, five days. They also typically will have some degree of acid reflux or um, GERD or um, heartburn is another word for that. Okay, uh, and the important thing here is you can treat SIBO with medications and supplements. However, if you don't treat the thyroid problem, it's going to come right back, okay? Which means that in order to treat SIBO and eradicate it completely, you really need to be treating, uh, getting the right treatment with um, thyroid medication, okay? Um, and the pretty cool thing about treating SIBO and yeast is they, the, the supplements will cover um, both of these conditions kind of simultaneously, so some of the herbs will do that. However, that's not going to be enough for, for everybody, so you might consider antibiotics like rifaximin or antifungals like uh, diflucan as well, so, uh, but you'll kind of have to talk to your doctor about that one. And the last one, number five, and um, I probably saved the best for last year, um, is something called low-dose naltrexone or LDN. All right, I did include a little bit of a um, uh, study up here showing how LDN is, can act as a novel anti-inflammatory treatment for chronic pain. Um, but really what it does is uh, it helps modulate the immune system. It reduces autoimmunity. In fact, in some of these uh, animal models, they've been able to completely suppress um, uh, conditions uh, autoimmune condition just by using this. Okay, so it's, it's pretty powerful, uh, modulates the immune system in low doses, helps differentiate between foreign tissue and self, and also helps lower inflammation. And I'd add in there too, also chronic pain. So one of the big things uh, that I always ask, or patients always ask me is how do I know if it's working? Uh, what I'll typically recommend is patients want to try it for at least two months. Okay, and um, typically the starting dose would be something like 1.5 milligrams taken at night because it can help you sleep in a certain uh, proportion of patients. However, it is very stimulating, so those patients would consider taking it in the morning. And then what you would do is you would slowly titrate up your dose. Probably at about 3 to 4.5 milligrams, milligrams per day is usually where most patients fall. Okay, Not everyone, but, but most patients. So um, low-dose naltrexone is certainly an awesome thing. I had a patient here just recently. Uh, she came in um, and she she was talking to me and she said, you know, I've been on the LDN for four months. I don't think it's doing anything for me. I, you know, I want to get off of it. So I said, okay, well, let's just try it. Go off of it and see what happens. She goes off it a week later. She calls me back. She's like, I, I have to get back on it. My, my joints are inflamed. I have chronic pain. You know, I, I'm, I'm dying here. And so that is definitely one of those, uh, if I would, I would um, I advise a, a word of caution to many patients if they're on it and they don't think it's working. Uh, don't just go off of it cold turkey because the chances are that it may actually be helping you and you may not really know it. So consider that as well. So there you have it. These are uh, five quick tips that I use uh, to lower TPO antibodies in patients. Um, you know, you're definitely going to want to make sure that you talk to your doctor about these things. Uh, a lot of them will require medications or prescriptions um, and also a knowledge of some of these things. But um, I wanted to help. I wanted to give this to you guys to help you out. So uh, let me know if you have any questions. Thanks, guys. Talk to you later.